Nothing become attuned to making decisions at a very fast, yeah, you know, instantaneous decision. Are you aware you're talking about millions, sometimes billions of dollars? Is it real money to you? Yes, it is actually. I, th I think so, yes. 50 p No. So how good at his job is John Key? He's exceptional. Um, he is one of the best that I've seen in my 12 years within the markets. He seems to have a sixth sense uh, with respect to where the market is about to move to. He just seems to know just a little bit quicker than most people exactly what's going to happen next. So what do you do to look after him? Um, we certainly uh, pay him adequately. Well, I'm making enough to be comfortable. Put that way. Your boss says the, the it ranges between 75,000 and half a million. Which mm. end of that are you? <laughs> I know which end I prefer to be. A former merchant banker who wants to be Prime Minister was forced to make an embarrassing admission about how many Transrail shares he owned. For the first time, Mr Keyes admitted he owned a great deal more than he'd previously revealed. And critically, the national leader owned those shares while he was pushing for another firm to buy into Transrail. The share register shows that on February the 15th, 2002, a trust owned by John Key and his wife, Brona, buys 30,000 Transrail shares, estimated to cost around $108,000. Four days later, on the 19th of February, the trust buys another 20,000 shares, worth around $72,000. These are shares we were never told about. In July 2002, John Key is elected to Parliament and over the next few months becomes National's Associate Transport Spokesman. He questions Michael Cullen in writing and in the House about so-called secret meetings between the government and Transrail, but he fails to reveal his shareholding. Then on May the 7th, 2003, John Key buys another 50,000 shares, this time under his own name, for an estimated $22,500. A couple of weeks later, he meets with Rail America, which is considering a bid for Transrail. In his newsletter, John Key writes, I hope the interest shown by Rail America will be picked up by others. He still doesn't admit he's a shareholder. On June 10, John Key sells his personal parcel of 50,000 shares for about $51,000, doubling his profit in just five weeks. John Key's never owned up to those extra shares despite a number of interviews with journalists about the issue. But that changed today when I caught up with him on the campaign trail. Are you confident that the New Zealand public can trust you? Absolutely confident. But what about when it comes to trading in shares? How many shares exactly did you and your family own in Transrail? Uh, 50,000 at the maximum point. Sometimes 25,000, sometimes 50,000. Did you personally buy 50,000 Transrail shares in 2003 and sell them five actually, weeks later? Look, actually, maybe 100,000 from every yes. Sometimes 50,000, sometimes 100,000, yep. Isn't that an issue you should be clear about? Uh, well, sorry, yeah, it was 100,000, yeah, in total. You've only ever been honest about the fact that your family trust owned 30,000 shares. Why has it taken till now to front up about the extra shares? Well, no one's ever asked me the number I've owned. I've always declared I own the shares. I have owned them. I uh, sold them on the date that I said. I don't ever believe I've traded shares for my own personal benefit with information I've had from Parliament. You did benefit, though. You doubled your money on those particular shares. The Prime Minister is rejecting accusations of a conflict of interest in the handling of his investments. His denial of any wrongdoing comes after claims from the opposition that a blind trust set up by John Key isn't actually blind at all. The idea is if he doesn't know or control those investments, they won't influence the decisions he makes. I have no concept or knowledge of what's in there and I stand by that statement 100%. When John Key became Prime Minister he put his money into a blind trust called Allgate. Another company called Whitechapel was set up around that time and that one is open for anyone to see. Labour claims Whitechapel was set up to mirror the actions of Allgate so the Prime Minister could monitor his investments. But John Key denies any knowledge of Whitechapel or its operations. Before this had you heard of Whitechapel? No. So are you, you're not using Whitechapel to look at the funds at Allgate? No, I mean, look, I don't know what's in my blind trust. But Pete Hodgson points out several links. Whitechapel has investments in wine, dairy and property companies that John Key previously had interests in too. Allgate and Whitechapel are both names of tube stations in London where the Prime Minister used to live and the director of Whitechapel works as a lawyer for John Key. Because he has failed to remove that conflict of interest, he's now under suspicion for it. The government's now eyeing up huge chunks of the conservation estate to be opened up to mining. Well, I think it's very likely that there will be mining on conservation land. 
This area in the north will be surveyed for mining. It includes a number of conservation sites, including the Tapaki Ecological Site beside Cape Rianga. On the west coast of the South Island, huge areas will be surveyed. Most of it, as you can see here, is conservation land. I do believe that there's opportunities to expand our mining and exploration interests done the right way. It can be exploited for the benefit of all New Zealanders. National is considering opening up more of the conservation estate so domestic and international firms can mine minerals. But does that place the Prime Minister in a difficult position given he owns shares in an Australian mining company? It's a very small Australian gold mine. I actually had a lot of shares in that company and I basically largely sold them. It was a remnant small amount. It's a, it's a tiny sort of thing. Mining's big business in Australia, and our Prime Minister was in on it, initially owning one million shares worth around $200,000 in a small gold exploration business that merged with a uranium mining company. Is that something that you, as a leader of a nuclear free country, would be concerned about, or is this not, not something you've looked into? It's not something I've looked at since I bought it back in 2001 when I was in Australia, so um, as I was a reasonable shareholder at the time. I actually sold the vast bulk of shares I owned. It was a very small amount, and the reason I didn't sell them was their value was so low. If they've done a merger, this is the first I know about today. Mining is back on the government's agenda, although not on conservation land. It's been in secret talks with Māori leaders about mining on tribal land, which could open up land covering an area almost 24 times the size of Lake Taupo. Patrick Gower reports. The government's mining plans made it plenty of enemies. But now it's finally found some friends, the leaders of the most powerful tribes in the country. Their interest was uh, in, in being part of the development of the, the oil and gas uh, minerals industry in New Zealand. It's a very, very welcome uh, uh, inquiry. That inquiry was made here in the Prime Minister's office last night. It came from an influential cabal called the Iwi Leadership Group. It included Naitahu, who own about 80,000 hectares of the South Island that could all be opened up to mining. But not all Māori are happy. Tribes on the east coast where there's been protests about offshore drilling weren't represented. Other iwi at the meeting covered the North Island, and the group's influence extends to over 50 tribes with land around the country. And with a total 1.47 million hectares in Māori control, that could be helpful with the government still keen to find places to drill. I don't ever believe I've traded shares for my own personal benefit with information I've had from Parliament. 